Uh, welcome to the Penn Humanities Forum. I'm Jim English, director of the forum. And uh, today we have the fourth presentation in our series on virtuality, a talk by film historian Tom Guy. Um, thanks for coming. Let me remind you to silence your phones. Um, let me say as well that uh, at the end of uh, Professor Gunning's talk, we'll have a five minute break for those who need to, to depart uh, early for, for any reason. And then, um, after everyone has had a chance to stand up and, and move out if they need to, we'll then begin the question and answer period uh, until 6.30. Uh, our topic today being movies, I want to point out that all forum events are filmed uh, and made available for your viewing on our website. There's Sarah Barney, our tech guru and uh, administrative coordinator and back filming um, uh, right now or will be shortly. Um, so do take a look at that if, you, um, if you've heard an interesting um, lecture here and you want to call it to a friend's attention, please point them to our website. They, they, they don't have to be here for the lecture on virtuality to experience the virtual version of the lecture. Um, okay, uh, I'm just coming from my teaching uh, of uh, my own class, uh, which is on Wednesday afternoons on, on the British cinema. Uh, one of a great many classes being offered this semester in, um, in, in cinema uh, at the School of Arts and Sciences. Penn has a terrifically vibrant cinema studies program, as many of you know, um, some of you involved in it. Uh, a ton of majors. Um, sometimes it seems like their events are going on around the clock 24-7. So it's easy to forget that the program didn't even exist until about a decade ago. It took, in fact, a long time and a lot of struggle to establish a foothold for film studies here, and not only here. As a legitimate academic discipline, granting higher degrees to students uh, in the US, film studies doesn't really go back further than the 1970s. And for about half of that stretch of time, film scholars basically carved out their place in the academy, uh, many of them, by being at the cutting edge of cultural theory and theory-inflected textual analysis. When I was in college, if you wanted to know how to do a Lacanian reading of a work of art, uh, or how to read Adorno and Horkheimer, um, you just had to go to the film person on campus. There's probably only one, uh, dating myself, but, uh, and they would probably be identified by, I don't know, like black leather gear or something. Um, and this person would be the one who could get you up to speed um, in, uh, in theory and in theoretical readings. Um, which is to say that there wasn't much happening in film history in these um, first couple of decades of film studies here. I mean, yes, there were people doing it. There was David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson and a few others, but no one seemed all that interested. The prevailing view seemed to be that a historical approach was too old-fashioned or too dull for this new maverick discipline. I wouldn't do it any credit. Uh, well, Tom Gunning did as much as, or more than, anyone to change this. From his first deployment of the term cinema of attractions to describe the films of the 1890s and early 1900s, Gunning showed that the historical archive had far more to offer uh, film studies than a bunch of information about forgotten people, institutions, and works. To seriously engage with the historical project of recovering and examining the films of the fin de siècle did not, in Gunning's hands, mean abandoning the excitements and challenges of theory. On the contrary, it required us to make more exacting use of our theoretical resources, to put theory into conversation with history such that each would be informed by, and at times modified by, the other. For Gunning, it was never a question of choosing between history and theory, but of continually re-theorizing historical method while adjusting theoretical propositions and arguments in light of historical discoveries. In particular, effects to theorize the grammar of film, the nature of film spectatorship, and so on, had tended to assume narrative form and narrative effects as always already dominant as simply fundamental to the cinema. Even films that attempted to disrupt narrative form or short circuit narrative effects were negatively told to narrative. Gunning toppled this assumption by, by revealing to us the radical alterity of the early fictional films, the films of attraction, showing that they weren't readily susceptible to the kinds of narrative analysis or narratologically driven theory that film studies was working with. Narrative continuity, he showed in his first book on D.W. Griffiths, was a minor or subordinate element on the landscape of film until at least 
1907 or 1908. Now, we were just talking about maybe I have the year of 1906, I'm not sure. Right around then. the narrative paradigm of Hollywood did, of course, uh, ultimately become dominant. Uh, but for purposes of grasping, of rigorously theorizing the cinema's narrative form and the range of its affective possibilities, the most interesting films were those of the transitional period when the cinema of attractions was still, so to speak, in the picture. And this ancient history of cinema, much of which had to be recovered, at least in the, in the American side, had to be recovered off paper prints, submitted for purposes of copyright. This turned out, in the wake of Gunning's path-breaking work, to be the most scintillating zone of textual analysis and theory going forward. Henceforth, theory uh, history was cool. Uh, now, Gunning has himself certainly gone forward uh, from there. Uh, and I'm not going to try to list all of his uh, accomplishments. I will simply say that he is the burden and distinguished service professor of art history at the University of Chicago, where he is also chair of cinema and media studies. He's the author, most recently, of the films of Fritz Lang, Allegories of Vision and Modernity. And he's going to speak to us this afternoon uh, about uh, visuality and conundrum of the image that moves. This paper is called The History of Virtual Movement. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tom Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm delighted to be here and uh, Thank you so much for this very generous um, uh, introduction, Jim. Uh, and I should mention, though, that to some extent, I'm even um, getting further back than, than, uh, than your introduction uh, discusses. Because to some extent, what we're going to talk about today is before there were movies, uh, about 19th century uh, processes of the uh, uh, moving image that precede Film, if we think of film as, as celluloid, uh, so um, this is these films and or rather these works and these devices are generally talked about in terms of a kind of prehistory of cinema, which actually, to my mind, is kind of limiting uh, and teleological, you know, indicating everything just was was going towards the invention of of, of celluloid. And I'm going to try to indicate that I think these devices from the 19th century. Uh, and even from the early part of the 19th century that I'm going to discuss, have their own interests and not just uh, as a kind of uh, origin or, uh, you know, uh, primitive form of, of something that later on was an enormous industry and, and commercial uh, uh, triumph. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm thinking, thinking even further back, uh, perhaps, than, uh, than, than I was introduced. I, I should add, though, here that, to my mind, the future, the whole point about history is that the future inspires the past. I mean, that, that uh, what we are going through at any particular moment makes the past appear in a different form and to ask different questions about the past. Uh, and in many ways, although, as I say, I'm going to be talking about things before even the invention of cinema, this is very much a research that's inspired by the current you know, client, climate and environment of new media. And it's exactly that kind of sense of a continuity and of particularly uh, discovery of, um, of, of virtual motion, as I'm going to call it, uh, that I want to explore. I recently, for an interview with a journal at the University of Chicago, uh, I told this anecdote that uh, uh, I often repeat to my students, uh, but which I do just find kind of irresistible, of, um, was told to me about Romania under uh, the uh, rule of Ceausescu, who, of course, was kind of the last surviving Stalinist and still was involved in that kind of Stalinist thing uh, where you know history was rewritten every time there was a change of minister or every time that some historical figure went in or out of favor so that you had to have constantly an updated version of the uh, historical account uh, to be politically correct. Uh, and uh, that one of the intellectuals said during this period, you know, the future is the only thing, it's the only hope we have, it's the only thing we can depend on, it's the only thing with any stability, because the past is always changing. And as a historian, I believe this is absolutely true. Now, let me just make sure that I've got to 
this image on before we begin. Okay, wait, I'm sorry. It's actually a second image. Okay. Virtual indicates something that seems to be, but does not exist in an absolute physical sense. It can refer especially to a visual appearance that's not material, as in the strict meaning of a virtual image, which the OED defines as, quote, an image resulting from the effect of reflection or refraction upon rays of light. Thus, David Brewster used the term in 1831 to describe the effect of an image that apparently appears behind a mirror when it's caused by a, by a convex mirror. So a virtual image appears somewhere other than the actual object is. A virtual image, though, is not the same thing as a traditional image, such as a painting, a sculpture, or even a photograph, which has a physical component, a material object. But the question remains about this term exactly. And what I want to ask is, is a light-formed image virtual? Now, what we're seeing here is an image of a phantasmagoric projection with a magic lantern, kind of form of back projection, as you can see, so that the image is projected onto a screen, but it's not a painting, it's not a photograph, it's a ray of light uh, coming through the lens, caught and held, certainly, by the material, but not, uh, not identical to that material itself. Um, needs a physical support in the sense of a screen, but the image itself doesn't partake of that material. Now, in an era such as we're living in now, and which has been evolving and growing since the 19th century, an era of optical images, the nature of the image has, I think, transformed. The technologies of projection and then later on of broadcast traffic in these immaterial light-formed images and I think that we as media theorists have not truly grappled with all the aspects of their innovative nature. We sense their difference, but what their difference is, is still, I think, in need of clarification. The sense of a transformation of the image actually becomes even more complex and multiplied when we're dealing with projected or broadcast moving images. Now, although the archaeology of the moving and virtual image goes back as far as the science of optics, so at least you know, to the beginnings of, of Western science, their technological production and their institutionalization over the last two centuries demands that we take them seriously and develop both a history and a theory of their nature and development. The recent development of new media only accents the need for this investigation. And the perhaps startling discovery that these new media have not only a history, but an archaeology, centuries old, is something we need to contemplate. Now, I hope in a project that I'm undertaking now uh, to investigate this tradition by focusing on its kind of paradoxes and contradictions. And I hope this evening to sketch some of the paradoxes, particularly of the moving image. And let me begin with a simple question. Is the moving image still an image? In what sense can an image move? Traditionally, images are pictures. They're static, they're still, they're unmoving. And I believe that a key issue for the renewal of media theory lies in facing what I think is a kind of almost unmentioned and unresolved scandal of our thought which is that we have a tendency to deny or feel uncomfortable about the moving image as moving. The inability to deal with the transformation movement brings to the issue of virtuality and representation is what I'm going to discuss tonight. Now, immediately, you might all be saying, nobody's uncomfortable with moving images. We have them around us all the time. That absolutely is true but it's exactly thinking them through that I think we haven't done. And I'll try to describe what I think this denial consists of. It has a long history, and one that I think is far from over. In the early 19th century, 
a series of devices appeared that produced moving images optically. This is one of them. This is a, uh, a zoetrope. I'll talk about it later on in describing how it works, but most of you, I think, have probably seen one or seen pictures of them or seen them in a, uh, a science museum. These devices were intended, again, kind of paradoxically, both to provide amusement for children and to demonstrate certain principles of optical perception to scientists and scholars. This dual identity, simultaneously a plaything and an experiment, led to their beautiful oxymoronic name. And this is, I love this, this term, it's going to be the title of my first chapter. Philosophical toys. These devices still supply amusement, even if probably of a somewhat nostalgic sort. And in fact, they're still used often to illustrate a particular 19th century application of a theory of perception known as the persistence of vision. Media theorist and art historian Jonathan Creary, in his groundbreaking essay, The Techniques of the Observer, has shown that 19th century theorists understood these new visual devices as a way of defining and measuring the physiological processes of the senses, particularly sight, and that they were also served as instruments in a kind of modern defining and disciplining of the senses. Close attention to subjective phenomenon, such as after images. Now, this is an image from the great um, Czech scientist and polymath of the 19th century, Pokinje, uh, who particularly dealt with uh, issues of visual perception. And he's dealing here with um, something which I'm going to talk about that has many different aspects, the after image. Um, images that are subjective in the sense of that they aren't views of the world. There's something in the physiology of the eye. And here he did a sketch of different ones. He constantly experimented on himself, often with rather disastrous consequences, particularly when he was discovering or uh, investigating vertigo and would get up on the top of buildings and see what it was that would make him dizzy and fall. Uh, but here he was drawing... Um, uh, after images, these images that would appear in his eye when he rubbed them or when he exposed himself to bright light or something of that sort. And these sorts of subjective uh, images were um, part of this new kind of physiological approach to perception that the Curry says began to dominate in the 19th century. And the moving images devices that I'm going to discuss combine the observation of the physiological phenomenon of visual after images with the theory which they called the persistence of vision, which was used to explain how these devices could make us see a virtual visual image. Okay, now I want to just spend a minute... Okay, this is uh, Che Guevara in negative. Look at the kind of X on his head his cap, for a moment. You've all done this type of thing, of course. Uh, stare at it, in fact. And then if you look to the side, particularly if you look to a more, uh, well, look to the, like the, uh, the colored border of the image, you'll see the after image in negative of, uh, of his face. And of course, this is, this is one of these subjective physiological factors of vision that... Um, it was being explored and discovered in the 19th century with people like Pukinje and Goethe and a variety of others and continue to be topics of uh, perceptual psychology uh, and physiolo physiology of perception uh, today. As I say, in the 19th century, they were used to explain the toys that I'm talking about, this production of moving images with this theory, which is called the theory of the persistence of vision, which I'm both going to describe and I'm going to critique. Basically, it's a totally debunked theory. Um, and in fact, early in the 20th century, the very first Gestalt psychologist demonstrated that the theory of persistence of vision just didn't hold up, that it actually misdescribed how perception occurred. But interestingly, and this is partly what I'm fascinated by, this explanation, while it's no longer accepted scientifically, 
is still, in a way, well, persistent. Uh, and in fact, you'll find it in textbooks on film. It's beginning to disappear. And uh, very often in science museums. Uh, I gave a talk on this in um, Istanbul uh, last year, and uh, right in, in a, a science museum. And uh, afterwards, we went down, and there was a whole you know, demonstration of the theory of the persistence of vision uh, right on the wall uh, using the very toys that I was talking about. Um, so it is, to me, something more than just the way that new theories have a kind of inertia, that, that old ones persist and you know, new explanations are, um, have to struggle to take over. Because, in fact, I feel that as an explanation of the virtual moving image, the theory of persistence of vision combined with the after image shows, actually, the way that we don't want to deal with motion. That in a certain way, we want to kind of explain it away and feel more comfortable with the still image. Okay, let me separate out different aspects of the theory. Uh, contemporary perceptual psychologist R.L. Gregory defines after images, which as I say, there's no question they exist, as, and this is Gregory's quote, the continually, continuing firing of the optic nerve after the stimulation. In other words, after an object has been removed from the field of vision, an image of it lingers, like the image of Che, do in Gregory's explanation, different people would use different terms, but to a physical process within the retina. By means of an after image, we paradoxically see an object even in its absence. And here, I'm sorry, it's not a very good quality uh, image, uh, but we see one of the earliest kind of optical devices, philosophical toys, the thaumatrope, which is a disc on a string which has on one side as you see here, a bird cage on the other side, a bird, a bird, when you twist it and rapidly make it alternate, you actually see the bird in the cage because the image of the bird, the after image of the bird or the after image of the cage uh, persist and, uh, and get combined. Um, now, this phenomenon had been observed for centuries. I mean, Aristotle, Ptolemy, Ibn Ahatham, and Leonardo all described things that are clearly uh, the same phenomenon. Uh, and it's probably the most dramatic example of what are called in the 19th century subjective visual phenomenon, that is, images that result from this bodily response rather than a kind of sampling of the world. As Crary puts it, quote, beginning in the mid-1820s, the experimental study of after images led to the invention of a number of related optical devices and techniques. The persistence of vision theory, as I've been saying, exemplifies the 19th century understanding of visual illusion as primarily a physiological phenomenon, which can be demonstrated, triggered, and even measured through mechanical and optical devices. As an explanation of the phenomenon of apparent motion, it's been basically discarded, but still, I think, has to be dealt with, not only because it's survived in many people's uh, imagination, but also as a historical fact, as a kind of revealing historical and cultural legacy, and one that um, reveals something about our attitudes towards motion. As film historian and theorist Marianne Doan has put it, quote, the theory of persistence of vision may be wrong, but the question remains, why was it so firmly ensconched, and what function did it serve? in the 19th century, unquote. The attitude towards vision maintained by the persistence of vision thesis reveals the interface the 19th century scientists thought they had discovered and in many senses had manufactured between human perception and a device or machine. The attraction of the theory for the 19th century, I believe, lies largely in its essentially mechanical view of the human sensorium, that in some way, we could think about the human senses in terms of a machine. Persistence of vision and these optical devices form, therefore, a kind of circular logic in which the devices are the cause of visual illusions as well as demonstrating their explanation. 
Besides spawning images of motion, these devices therefore forged a new dependent relation between the still and the moving image. As each enacted the trick of a transition from a static image to a moving image. However, we might claim that the real trick lies in making the moving image appear as nothing more than a peculiar modification of the still image, an evanescent epiphenomenon founded in the inert and reliable still image. Persistent after images offered a theory of perception which broke movement into static phases and still images, an attempt, therefore, to dissolve movement into stasis. This, I claim, indicates a pervasive cultural prejudice against movement and a preference for stillness. Let me just make sure, I, in case anyone hasn't seen the zoetrope, that you understand what we're talking about here. I'll demonstrate the phenakistoscope, which is related uh, in just a minute, but just to kind of fill you in. As you can see, there's a band of images inside this, this drum, which will revolve, and you'll look through the slots. We'll see a diagram of this in a minute. And on the band are a variety, a succession of images of stages of motion, still images, of course. The point is that once you revolve this, you see not just a succession, such as we see when we look in, but an actual transformation of one image into the next, and therefore the phenomenon of motion. Let me just go over, therefore, what the theory of persistence of vision, how they would explain this phenomena. The theory is founded on the fact that the motion picture devices, whether the first 19th century devices such as the phenakistoscope or the zoetrope or later motion picture film, which has the same principle, all employ a continuous series of static drawings or photographs depicting separate phases of an action on some sort of a material support, so the band that we see inside there. Now, a device, such as this drum, moves these still images through some type of viewer, in this case, the slots, at a sufficient speed to create what is often called apparent motion. What we see is a dancer dancing, a horse galloping, uh, here a lion leaping through a, a kind of a hoop, um, a man walking. Now, how does this happen? In 1912, one of the earliest books published on the nature of cinema, Frederick Talbot's Moving Pictures, How They Are Made and Worked, provides an especially vivid description of this kind of theory of persistence of vision. So this is Talbot's description. Suppose, for instance, that a series of pictures depicting a man walking along the street are being shown on the screen. In the first picture, the man is shown with his left foot in the air. This remains in sight for a 32nd of a second and then disappears suddenly. Though the picture has vanished from the eye, the brain still persists in seeing the left foot slightly raised. One 32nd part of a second later, the next picture shows the man with his left foot on the ground. The brain receives the impression that the man has changed the position of his foot in relation to the stationary objects. And the left foot, which was raised, melts into the left foot upon the ground. The eye imagines that it sees the left foot descend. Now, this is basically the persistence of vision theory. And in fact, it kind of sounds very logical. I think this is partly why it survived. It, we kind of believe it. It makes sense. But already in 1916, Hugo Munsterberg, the uh, Harvard perceptual psychologist who also wrote on film, described the error of this description. And the error is very subtle. The perception of movement is an independent experience which cannot be reduced to a simple seeing of a series of different positions. After images and apparent motion certainly both exist, but they don't explain each other entirely. The simple persistence of a series of after images in different positions cannot automatically yield a moving image. In fact, if you think about it, if you have a persistence of after images piling up on each other, what you're going to get is not movement. It's like a palimpsest of superimpositions. You know, they would be you know, all on top of each other. Something else has to supply 
the uh, illusion or the appearance, rather, let me say, of, of motions. Now, the problem is what that something else is. Nobody's exactly sure how to describe. Contemporary theories of perception have broken apparent move, motion into multiple interrelating factors. The main thing is it's just not that simple. It's not that mechanical. And the complexities of the various factors that are probably involved, in fact, still allow for some degree of controversy and even some uncertainty. But the inadequacy of the persistence of vision theory is clear. It just doesn't work. It isn't enough. And in fact, this was done in 1912 by Max Wertheimer's, uh, whose critique of persistence of vision actually pretty much inaugurated Gestalt psychology, which questioned the mechanistic physiological assumptions of previous perceptual psychology. Writing more recently, R. L. Gregory's classic accounts of visual perception, eye and brain, states that the continuous action is seen in the motion picture film, quote, relies upon two rather distinct facts. Other people will say three. The first is persistence of vision, and the second is what he calls the phi phenomenon, which is basically something that allows us to see motion. Most perceptual psychologists today agree that multiple factors contribute to apparent motion, and persistence of vision is at most only contributing a factor of continuity. You know, we do see one horse because of the persistence of after images, but the movement comes from something else. Vital as the scientific discussion of perception remains, that's not where my main emphasis is. As a media historian and theorist, what I want to do is go back and probe the ideological assumptions of the persistence of vision thesis. And as I've said, I feel the theory reveals a powerful reluctance to deal with the moving image and a desire to basically explain it away rather than to acknowledge its uniqueness. Here we see another zoetrope band, and you can see that kind of breaking into different phases of motion. And here, of course, a very early Edison film, uh, actually probably not on film, probably on one of his uh, cylinders, uh, in which we see actions broken down by the camera into its various components, which then, of course, in projection would, would take on the appearance of motion. The delightful union of amusement with science that the term philosophical toys implies is evident in a book that I want to look at for getting at what is, I think, an issue with this theory of persistence of vision. John Arton Paris' 19th century book for educating young people, Philosophy in Sport Made Science in Earnest, being an attempt to illustrate the first principles of natural philosophy, which, of course, was the 19th century term for science, by the aid of popular toys and sports. Paris explains the apparent movement produced by philosophical toys in terms of a theory of motion that claims that perceiving motion is less something seen than something deduced. Now, what I want to do here is point out how much these toys become kind of a stand-in for a theory of how we see, not just how we see the toy, not just how the toy produces motion, but how we see motion. This is the quote from Paris. Now, it's evident that before the eye can ascertain a body to be in motion, it must observe it in two successive portions of time in order to compare its change of place. Quote, end of quote. Now, he supports this statement with a quote from Lord Broome, who was then Lord Chancellor and a member of the British Royal Society, which, of course, was the scientific society of the 19th century. And Broome said, quote, Our knowledge of motion is a deduction of reasoning, not a perception of sense. It is derived from the comparison of two positions. The idea of a change of place is the result of that comparison attained by a short process of reasoning, unquote. Now, this claim reveals what I've been calling a central prejudice about the actual perception of motion, that motion must be the product of a mental or physical processing of still images. This assertion of the still image as the true substance of the moving image is the specter that haunts the 19th century understanding of the moving image. 
denying the reality of the moving image on its own. Philosophical toys produced images that moved using revolving wheels or drums with slots or indentations through which the viewer peered. The production of motion was founded upon a breakdown of vision into flashes, flickers of instantaneous vision produced by a rapidly revolving shutter. In this case, looking through the slots of the uh, drum of the zoetrope, which would be moving very rapidly, so you'd get these, these flashes of looking through it uh, to the image on the other side. The most popular of these devices was Plateau's revealing, I'm sorry, revolving wheel toy, the phenakistoscope, which set off what Laurent Menoni has called a phenakistoscope cra craze. Now, this is a woman in a Parisian salon looking at a phenakistoscope. She's looking in a mirror. We'll explain the whole process. Uh, her husband dutifully, or lover probably, uh, holding a variety of other discs behind her and also looking over her shoulder. So this is, you know, the indication of how this became a parlor entertainment, perhaps even with a kind of almost erotic component. It could be claimed that this device, which was a little earlier than the zoetrope that we just looked at, provided the first unambiguous example of an optical moving image. The name of the device, derived from the Greek phoenix, a cheater or deceiver, marked the view it offered as deceptive, and here is Plateau's physical description of his invention. I'll bring on a clearer diagram of it here. The apparatus essentially consists of a cardboard disc pierced along its circumferences with a certain number of small openings and carrying painted figures on its sides. So you can see the slits in the middle there on the one side. You see them with light coming through on the other side. They look dark. And you can see the drawing here of a cantering horse uh, around the perimeter of the, of the disc itself. When the disc is rotated about a center facing a mirror and looking with one eye opposite the openings, the figures are animated and execute movements. So the viewer holds the device by handle in one hand while peering through the slots and sets a wheel turning, usually spinning it with the single finger of her other hand. The slots punctuate the vision of images on the moving disc, converting the passing figures into a single flickering moving image rather than a continuous blur. The figures drawn on the periphery portrayed a figure engaged in the successive stages of a simple repetitive motion. A dance, a horse cantering, sawing wood, opening one's mouth in a grimace, or juggling balls. Like most of his contemporaries, Plateau explicitly explain the functioning of his device in terms of the persistence of vision. And here we have one where a uh, new invention, the locomotive, um, uh, what would turn, of course, is the, the drive wheel of the engine. But here's Plateau's explanation. If several objects that differ sequentially in terms of form are represented one after another to the eye in very brief intervals and sufficiently close together, the impression they produce on the retina will blend together without confusion, and one will believe that a single object is gradually changing form and position, in other words, moving. End of quote. This device produced the first widespread virtual moving image. In other words, a continuous moving image produced by an optical device. But I want to linger over its perceptual effect, not just its mechanics. The phenakistoscope creates a virtual image, an optical phenomenon that is not identical to any of the individual images that make it up. Rather than an image with a single material base, it's a perceptual image, produced by motion and thus virtual. But the effect of the motion produced remains unique and novel. And Paris describes his young students, quote, great astonishment at observing the figures in constant motion and exhibiting the most grotesque attitudes, unquote. In spite of these uncanny and grotesque effects, Paris, however, or the narrator of the book, uses the device again to explain what he claims is our normal perception 
of motion. This is an illustration from Paris's book, in which actually he's demonstrating a thaumatrope. But you can see the kind of logic of the book as you know, a man explains to his charges uh, through these devices, these principles. So here is his explanation. Each figure is seen through an aperture, and as it passes, and is succeeded in rapid succession by another and another, differing from the former in attitude, the eye is cheated into the belief of it being the same object successively changing the position of its body. Consider what takes place in an image on the retina when we actually witness a man in motion. For instance, a man jumping over a gate. In the first moment, he appears on the ground. In the next, his eyes are a few inches above it. In the third, they're nearly on the level with the rail. In the fourth, he is above it. And then in the successive moments, he's seen descending as he had previously risen. A precisely similar effect is produced on the retina by the successive substitution of figures in corresponding attitudes as through the orifices of the revolving disk, each figure remaining on the retina long enough to allow its successor to take his place without an interval that would destroy the illusion. The phrase, the eye is cheated, that's the end of the quote, makes, marks again the suspicious nature of this discourse towards the senses. The senses are not to be trusted. What makes sense is logic, reason. Now, I would maintain that the true sleight of hand employed here lies in using a device that produces motion from a series of still images as a way of explaining and understanding the normal human perception of motion. If the toy creates only an illusion of motion, does this indicate that all perception of motion is simply an illusion? And if that's not what he's saying, why isn't that what he's saying? Like Lord Broom's description of movement as a process of reasoning and comparison, Paris's explanation of actually witnessing movement starts from the assumption that in perception, the still image is primary and reliable, sure in some sense, and that movement consists of a mental deduction based on comparing static positions. I'm going to show you an image here, and I'm going to do it briefly because it's irritating. It is from a keen phenakistoscope, but it's animated through a computer, so it's not exactly the way you would see it. But I want to show you a little bit that sense of how strange movement can be uh, in, this, uh, in these devices, even though it doesn't exactly reflect the way it would be if we, we saw it. It is a, a real disk. Uh, the rate is probably. Well, of course, the rate depends on how you turned it. You could see something like this. Now I'm going to show you one that's a little more bearable. I'll explain it in a minute, but let me continue this dis uh, reading this discussion of Broom. Broom's explanation and Paris's lesson, drawn from the Phoenix scope, explain human conception through, the mechani through a mechanical explanation of a mechanical device, rather than exploring the new medium effects as an expansion of human perception, which is what I'm going to explore in a minute. Now, this is a phenakistoscope. It's actually one created rather late in the 19th century by Edward Mybridge. Um, and here you can see that sense of the movement. This is maybe a little too slow. I mean, all the things as they are done on computers don't exactly reflect, and hopefully some of you have had the experience of looking in a phenakistoscope and seeing what this is like. But you can see, yes, it's a series of stills, and you can kind of see it that way, but something else happening too. Such denial of motion as a perceptual fact reveals an innate prejudice against motion that extends to the moving image. Paradoxically, it also reveals the fascination the moving image offers to this day through the resistance that it encounters. Picking up and playing with a 19th century optical device allows anyone to re-experience the transformation of a still image into something else, opening up a virtual world. Beyond demonstrating the phenomenon of the after image or apparent movement, the fascination this movement draws from us endures, I think, even today. The moving image breaks out of its pedagogical purpose of explaining the mechanics of vision 
when this perceptual playfulness and delight triumphs over its philosophical discipline. Most discussions of persistence of vision claim it results from a defect or weakness of the human eye. This claim per se as one of the most enduring statements on the nature of the moving image, even among theorists who've absolutely rejected the persistence of vision thesis. Just so I don't drive you crazy. Quote, moving image media such as film and video couldn't exist if human vision were perfect, claim David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson in the most recent edition of the standard textbook of film studies, Film Art and Introduction. Now, I've always found such descriptions of this ability to blend still images into a moving image as an imperfection of the eye, curious and extremely Cartesian, in the sense of driving a wedge between what we know and what we see and decidedly valuing what we know over what we see. Presumably, if our eyes were perfect, we'd only see still images. Unfortunately, it's imperfect, so we see movement. Uh, an optical toy produces a moving image, which I see. It's not some weird eccentricity. It's an, exper an experience I can share with others. And yet, I'm also very aware of the production of the moving image and my manual role in producing it. Marianne Doan, one of the few film scholars who attempts to describe the image produced by optical devices, offers an explanation of its attribution to deception and trickery based on its virtual nature. She says, the image of movement itself was nowhere but in the perception of the viewer. It was immaterial, abstract, thus open to a practice of manipulation and deception. The toys could not work without this fundamental dependence upon an evanescent, intangible image. This aspect might best be described as a virtual moving image. As a trick, this virtual image surprises me, not only because I know it isn't really there, but because I participate in its appearance by manipulating the device. But if this is a trick, it remains rooted in tangible devices and practices. As Doan says, the tangibility of the apparatus and the materiality of the images operate, uh, operate as a form of resistance to this abstraction, assuring the viewer that the image of movement can be produced at will through the labor of the body and could indeed be owned as a commodity. But if we're aware of the act of manipulating an optical device as a form of production, we're also aware that it produces only an ephemeral image that vanishes as soon as the manipulation stops. While theorists such as Bordwell and Thompson describe the production of this motion in terms that would, should make us aware of the feeble and imperfect aspects of our senses, of a weakness, I wonder if that's the actual experience that we have, that kind of sober disillusionment. I want to stress the playful and aesthetic dimension of these toys. The delight that comes, frankly, from playing with yourself and with your perception. Why, in fact, shouldn't this ability to see the moving image be viewed as a faculty, an ability, rather than a defect? Why do we have to worship Medusa, who stills everything into a frozen moment? I experience the production of this virtual image as extending my conception of vision, rather than as some sort of failure of my eyesight. After all, these are toys. They're devices designed to give pleasure, not cause frustration at my failings. We certainly feel as we observe and produce a moving image that we're seeing in a different manner. We glimpse a virtual world. It does not resemble the fixed and static image that constitutes the norm of pictorial expression. To claim that the moving image does not exist or exists simply as an illusion reveals again a prejudice towards perception as a static process, towards veracity as something viewable only from a fixed and stable perspective, vision understood as a still picture. I'm claiming that the moving image fascinates partly because of his constant impulse to exceed what is already known and already grasped in favor of mobile possibilities. So I think it's worth pausing at the threshold in the nature of imagery that the phenakistoscope and its successors have crossed, and that we've all crossed, but whose ramifications we maybe haven't thought about.
Since the beginning of culture, movement has played a role within artworks, whether through the physical movement of actors and dancers, puppets and automatons, or shadows and pictorial figures. But with these mechanical devices, we're actually seeing virtual moving images produced optically. I maintain this marks a revolutionary moment in the history of the image, one whose radical epistemic nature we haven't fully appreciated or explored. To describe the perception achieved by these devices without recourse to the mechanical description of how they operate remains a kind of challenge, precisely because their effect overturns our dominant conception of representation as a still picture. We're generally more comfortable describing how these devices work than trying to describe how they affect us as viewers. Let me be clear. What I'm claiming is these devices don't represent motion. They produce it. They don't give us a picture of motion. What we see is, and this is uh, Plateau's first phenakistoscope disc of a dancer, and when it revolves, we see a dancer dancing. We don't see a series of still images. We see it transform into motion. Likewise, therefore, it doesn't represent motion. We could say this image of the divine Ignatz Mouse hitting his brick on the noggin of Crazy Cat represents motion with the little lines and the zip pow. You know, that's a representation of motion. What we see in a phenakistoscope makes a picture move. For perceptual reasons, which I love the fact, we still don't totally understand them. But whatever they are, we actually see movement, provided the apparatus is properly made and operated. Earlier devices represent or allude to movement through multiple pictures. Magic lanterns would often have two different stages of an action. You know, here, putting the ass's head on the figure, you know, with the idea. But although they show the beginning and the ending of an action, they're totally separate. With what I'm talking about here, it's not just alluding to motion, it is actually showing us motion, making an image that moves. So my task in describing this threshold might be easier if I simply said that what a phenacistoscope does is produce an illusion of motion. But this is a thorny term, and I don't want to descend into philosophical conundrums. From one viewpoint, I would agree we are dealing with something like an illusion, in that the successive drawings of Plateau's dancer never move, except when they're in the phenakistoscope moving. But I'm not willing to say that when the wheel is spun and I look through the aperture, I don't see a dancer moving. I do. The position I'm taking here is obviously phenomenological. That is, I maintain that perception doesn't have to be dissolved into its physiological processes. I'm not against doing this if we're studying physiology. But if we're trying to describe the moving image, something else looms before us as a task. The riddle of the perception of the moving image lies in the fact that no one can explain it purely physiologically, and even the psychological explanations are still debated. In other words, we have here a true challenge for explanation. Yet the phenomenological description, the experience of our seeing of it, while still difficult, is, I think, possible. We see motion, yet it is truly somehow different from seeing a physical dancer or a puppet. We see a moving image two-dimensional in appearance, we are entering into the realm of the virtual. A moving image delights us with its novelty because most images don't move, but also for its familiarity since it recalls for us the way we actually perceive the world, which is primarily moving. Recent investigators of perception claim the greatest distortion in our understanding of visual perception comes from assuming that it's founded on the static image, on pictures to which somehow movement is superadded. As the ecological and phenomenologically minded perceptual psychologists, such as the late J.J. Gibson and uh, currently Alvin Noe, have demonstrated, movement actually should provide the norm for visual perception because our eyes are moving, our bodies are moving, and the world moves around us as well in concert and independently of it. Us. The static retina image is a myth 
created in the perceptual laboratory. I believe our investigation of the discourse surrounding the early moving image devices shows that the mechanistic worldview of the 19th century was determined to see human perception in terms of machines and in terms of static images. Thus, the education offered by philosophical toys included not only the disciplining of the senses that Curry finds embedded in these devices, but a worldview in which the viewer identified his and others' perception with the operation of a machine and a static, jerky rhythm. This was an education with social and political consequences. While I resist describing the moving image as an illusion, I think one might describe it as a trick, a trophy, a turn, a transformation that surprises us. Partly because we do indeed see it, not simply mistake it. The moving image is an illusion only if we assume our eyes are defective. If we think of it as seeing, if we think of seeing as a multifaceted way of exploring the world and indeed of delighting in it, then a trick need no more be an illusion, that is a falsity, than is a difficult gymnastic or acrobatic turn or a feat of juggling. While the educational logic of philosophy and sport made science in earnest, labors to transform children's astonish astonishment and delight into earnest discipline and education, it also exceeds its purpose. The dancer pirouettes endlessly, and if its visual fascination may serve the end of seduction into taking one's place willingly within the apparatus or before the screen or at the keyboard, this doesn't mean to necessarily that that's the only reason that pleasure is produced or that pleasure is always complicit. The apparatus, while it subjects our vision and behavior to a specific regimen necessary for the transformation into a moving image to take place, also remains very much in our hands and within our sight. And here we see, particularly in the top, one of the most wonderful, I think, of these visual devices, one that still you can find in every gift shop, probably even upstairs here, the flip book, which children love to flip with their thumb. In Germany, it's called the Thumb Kino, and in which we get the sense very much of the transformation from still into movement and of our control of it. We see the whole apparatus and its parts, and we can observe the still images before we set them into action. These philosophical toys display what Crary calls the undisguised nature of their operational structure, their evident mechanical reduction based on the functional interaction of body and machine. They lack the concealing of the operating mechanism that Theodore Adorno identified with the phantasmagoria and which became part of the classical cinema. Marianne Doan states this explicitly, quote, the optical toy is anti-phantasmagoric anti in this respect. It doesn't hide the work of its operation, but instead flaunts it. As Marianne Doan emphasized and Crary indicated, optical devices present the machine as a toy, unthreatening and inviting. Part of its attraction lies in the manipulation of the apparatus itself, that which one holds in one's hands, as much as in the evanescent image it produces. What Doan characterizes as their tactility, manipulability, and materiality. These optical toys, as she elegantly puts it, mark a moment when the viewer, quote, seems to hold movement in his or her hands, unquote. Yet even acknowledging the nostalgia that such a simple control of the device evokes, the production of the moving virtual image remains a crucial threshold in the modern transformation of the image I'm tracing. As Doan describes it, quote, a hesitation in the transition from still to moving image underscores the wondrous nature of its effect, its alliance with that legend of the toy that comes to life. While the trick of motion, it's the end of her quote, while the trick of motion undoubtedly partakes of the uncanny effect of the animating of the inanimate, which of course is the stuff of childhood fairy tales and myth for millennia, it also, I think, takes on a new meaning in our modern era, and it supplies both the historical and theoretical portal into the new world of virtuality. Thank you very much.
directly as another moving object you know, or another moving representation. We're taking like in effect like a stochastic motion mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we're translating it into very discrete images. And maybe we might not have this kind of gap if we're going stochastic to stochastic. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a it's a crucial question, um, and um, I, to some extent, my approach to it is a little polemical. Uh, you know, in other words, I'll, I'll emphasize one side of it. What you're saying is absolutely right, if I, if I understand you correctly, that basically the way technology of the motion picture camera, let's say, or the video camera work is that it takes a series of still images, which then, in projection, become images of motion. I'm a little bit saying, yes, absolutely, but maybe that doesn't matter so much. Now, I'm not really saying it doesn't matter at all, because I actually think it's very important. But to some extent, what I'm saying is, the, one of the reasons I think the persistence of vision has persisted, even though we, don't, we know it's not true, is that it does seem to describe what you're describing, the way we capture the image, the technology of it, the actual... You know, the machine itself does record still images. But what I'm saying is, once we see them in motion, they're in motion. You know, now, I'm not saying that it isn't extremely interesting that, in fact, underlying that is the still images. And, in fact, what I'm kind of saying at the end is, the great thing is when you can teeter back and forth. You know, uh, but in teetering back and forth, I'm also emphasizing that when it begins moving, it's moving, you know, and that that in itself is extraordinary. We don't go, that's not real motion because it's, um, what was your phrase? Uh, yes, right, which is terrific, you know. Um, I mean, for instance, you, I'm sure you, you know this sequence, and I, you know, if I were going to do a four-hour lecture, this would be there, uh, in um, uh, Vertov's Man with the Movie Camera, where he takes the images of people and he stills them. And for a moment, you get this amazing moment of, of, you know, of what we have, a freeze frame, which is an extraordinary moment. We really feel motion, I think, particularly when it freezes. But then he also unfreezes it. And it's actually both of those things. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I guess this partly sticks in my mind because when we were young deconstructionists, we'd all say, oh, what Vertov is doing here is destroying the illusion of motion. You know, he's showing the materiality of it. He's showing the still image. Absolutely true. But what we neglected to notice is he's also saying, look at it move. You know, when it moves, it's alive. You know, and in those images, when we see you know, from the sense of something as a celluloid material object to this moment of a child laughing, we're there with the laughter, you know. So if, if you under, I, absolutely you're, I, I mean, I know you had another question in there, which I'll, I'll try to turn to, too. What I'm saying is, yes, it is true. We do, the technology works by breaking these things into fragments. But all too often we assume that's how we see them, too, which I'm saying is not true. It, it, it's the basis, but something else happens in the perception, which is important. So... Certainly, it's extremely interesting to think about, which I think is partly what you're asking about, is almost technological developments. Could there be other modes by which we were actually um, capturing motion? I guess the thing I would think about it is I actually think, even though this is not one of the things I make explicit at all, that the fact that this is not a real motion, it's not a dancer on the stage, is part of its virtuality. It's part of its um, quality as image rather than as reality. And that I think that's extremely important, too, that we see real motion, but we don't see a real object moving. Uh, does that... Yeah, okay, good. I, I mean, I thought I understood what you're asking me, though it's, you're always afraid that maybe you're asking, answering a totally different question. So. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm still back on the persistence question. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if anyone's in 
people are not as those people are introduced to it's own Yeah. Another, of course, sort of the inverse of that is even in real life, we do perceive what's happening. In fact, of course, we're always a lag because in reality, we see what we do before we hear farther. There's a delay. And I can think of many instances where what we find is real, actual emotion is really an apparent, is an inference after the fact of something apparent. So one example I like is if you meet like a Tai Chi master, first you see his fist down sort of behind his kidney, and then the next thing you know, it's on your shoulder. And so there's an inference after the fact that there's motion, but motion is never seen. So those are the two points. And then the third thing is I'm very interested in Morgan Fisher's film. And most people would go right to the obvious choice, but I'm more interested in standard gauge, mm -hmm. which goes right to the question of these different kinds of emotion all existing at the same time. Because in this film, of course, it's a film. You have these yes. films, and he has a film under the light table holding the strip of film still. And then when he's finished talking about that strip of film, he pulls it out from under the light table, you get a third kind of motion. Mm -hmm. So you have all these different mechanisms wrapped up together. Uh, uh, but I guess the first two are really... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, let me see. Now, the, the first one... Um, yeah, persistence in, in our actual perception. If you have a person with brain damage... Yes, yeah, okay, are there... Yes, okay, yes, no, I remember now. I'm sorry, I, they're all persisting. Uh, um, the first one I have thought about and wondered, and I don't know the answer to. You know, my... Guess is, but I, um, this is probably wrong. It does seem to me odd that I've never heard anyone talk about, you know, we, we, with all the fascination about neurological disturbances, that I've never heard about someone who can't see a motion picture. Now, my guess is it does exist, you know, uh, but it's curious, I have never, that's never been cited that I've seen. That, that may just be, I mean, I guess it probably means it's rare, but, uh, but I do wonder about it myself. Are, is there, one would kind of presume, you know, if it's a physiological and psychological process, which is what the feeling is now, is that it's both, that there must be, you know, circumstances where it would fail. I, however, I've never heard about it. And it's, it's curious. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to, the fact that's not evidence that I've never heard of it. But um, I kind of assume it probably does happen, but it is curious. So, yeah. Well, if there is someone who cannot see an after image, mm -hmm. specifically what I asked, ah. I presume that they in fact could still see the illusion of emotion. That's possible. So that's yeah. what I was asking. Yeah, yeah. Whether people like that sensation. Yeah. There's what, what? People who hallucinate a yeah. sensation, which is the other thing. Yeah. Um, well, n not to my knowledge, but it, it again, you know, I'm not a neurologist, so, you know, I don't want to speak too authoritatively. The second thing, though, is, is quite curious um, because it, it raises all the kinds of issues that, that, that I'm, I'm curious about. And it's particularly the, the term that you used, inference, which is very much like Lord Broom's. You know, because we see things in two different positions, we do an operation of mind and say it moved. My point would be, as, as basically a phenomenologist, and this would be very much the way that J.J. Gibson, I think, would approach this as well, is to say it's not as though we actually infer, you know, which is a logical process. Now, that might be the best term for just explaining in ordinary language what we do, but his point would be this is something automatic. This is part of perception. You know, that again and again in our perception, we, are, we aren't just dealing with things that we literally see. We're dealing with all the kind of aporia in our visual field, all the things that we don't see and that we know are there, not because of logic, but because of the way we are in the world. So that Gibson makes the point that we absolutely do see you know, the backside of objects, not because of memory, not because of a logical process, but because our awareness of the world includes the fact that we're mobile, that we walk around things, that we know things have a backside. So that even though we can't say what's back there without seeing it, we know it has a backside. So that we have that sense of, you know, 
even though we don't see the, the fist going in that arc, we don't go, oh, it must have moved because, logically. We, we feel it very directly as a, as a motion. And this, of course, was also for, for Bergson as well, you know, uh, Ari Bergson, uh, at the beginning of the ni- uh, 19th century, end of the 20th, or I mean, beginning of the 20th, end of the 19th, uh, saying that, you know, motion has its own logic, its own force. It isn't just moving through a series of static points mathematically. We tend to mentalize and logicalize our uh, interaction with the world because that is how we think it back further. You know, can I prove that it's, you know, that his hand moved? But in fact, in our actual perception, we just see it move, even though we don't necessarily literally see it. We have a sense of that motion. We, we have a sense of perceiving it. So that would be the answer to that, which, of course, is a particular you know, viewpoint on it that, that I'm endorsing. Um, the Morgan Fisher, uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that is fascinating to think about is the variety of motion that motion pictures allow. I studied with uh, Peter Kabelka, and one of the things that Kabelka claimed, particularly with this film, Arnold Freiner, was that he proved that films didn't have to have motion. Arnold Freiner is a film that flickers with black and white frames. I'm not sure what to call it, but I'm not sure that I could say it doesn't have motion. It doesn't represent motion. It doesn't have a moving object. But certainly in that transformation back and forth between light and dark, I have an amazing experience of motion. But it is a different type of motion. And one of the things that I think it's absolutely true, the possibility particularly of abstract film raises is of exploring other types of motion than the motion that is familiar to us from the world. Yeah. Kabelka himself relates, you know, Arnold Freiner to lightning. You know, and uh, you know, even though he's not representing lightning, even though he's not filming lightning, that sense of our experience of lightning, of time, of of transformation, I think is really important. I sometimes do think that a lot of what we're talking about here, of what, what I'm talking about can be assumed into a larger category of transformation. Um, and that, therefore, it includes some other phenomenon. But movement is, is a subcategory. It's not, not, all transfer, not all transformation is movement. Um, so so I, some of the things that you're talking about in Morgan Fisher and other uh, filmmakers may be more transformations than movement. But, I, but particularly what you're describing, where the actual film strip is moving, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Tom. And um, sort of two questions, one quick preliminary and speculative. I, I wonder where you see this work going in terms of the implications of the film study. I mean, I'll just offer a, a brief thing that occurred to me, which is that it, it could likely put pressure on certain received notions of uh, sort of genre and category, so for instance, getting an animation. Mm-hmm. My other question has to do with uh, this phenomenon of virtual image, and it's sort of a historical perceptual question, which is where does the camera obscura uh, fit into mm-hmm. this? Um, yeah. There was a kind of a weird event this summer where I realized there was a camera obscura in my bedroom. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. The air conditioner was you know, blocking most of the light. Um, found this out while I was trying to get my son to go to sleep. But it has this sort of a mesmerizing right. quality to it that's very similar, and yet it's also different. And it occurs to me that one of the things that maybe if you put more emphasis on it would emerge more clearly is this fact of the variability of the motion yeah. in the mechanical reproduction. So that it's actually almost impossible to have it be perfectly normal motion yeah. immediately. That's yeah. Yes. And the possibility for the manipulation that's not there in the camera obscura. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess to phrase that in the form of a question is does the camera obscura fit into this paradigm yeah. of virtual image or not? Real quick to do the first one quick because the second one really fascinates me. Um, the um, implications, I think, are partly to say we can't deal with film unless we deal with motion. And if we jump to 
narrative, if we jump to psychology, if we jump to representation, we're jumping over something, which, of course, the points we've got to do, you know. Um, but, um, you know, t- to me, it's a, it, it doesn't make sense that a, a textbook on, on cinema will begin with narrative form rather than beginning with what it's like to look at motion. But, of course, if you think motion only occurs because your eyes aren't perfect, you might want to go to narrative. Secondly, uh, the camera, my second chapter is about the camera obscura precisely because I suddenly said, wait, what about the camera obscura? Now, on the one hand, it's the perfect illustration of this kind of prejudice I'm talking about because the history of the camera obscura is primarily told in terms of its aid to painting and drawing and perspective. It's, it's as a tool for making still images. But in fact, in its origin, what fascinated everybody was the moving image. But it's not a moving image based on these, this, vir- this type of virtuality. It's a projected image, so it's virtual in that sense. But the movement is basically, I'm not sure the term for it, but it's not optically produced. I mean, the image is optically produced, but the movement is, I mean, I try to avoid the word indexical except for when it's impossible to avoid, and I think this might be an instance where it is. So it's, it actually does, I mean, I'm partly stalled in the second chapter because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I've got to solve this. Uh, so exactly the, the, the problem you're uh, announcing is, is extremely important. But the thing that I would emphasize about it, the, the part that I think I, is news, not news, I mean people knew that it was a moving image, but it's the emphasis on the camera obscura as movement, even though it makes a problem. How do we account for that movement? Uh, because it is different from, from the movement of the, of the devices. So when I said it's not till the 19th century, you know, I immediately went, well, wait, what about, you know, the optical, uh, the camera obscuras of the 16th century and 17th century? Um, but, but then I thought, yes, but they aren't producing the movement. And so that sense of producing is different. But exactly what they're doing, capturing movement, I don't know that I've come with an adequate, adequate term. But it's an important part of the moving image, and it is an alternate. It is something different. I would like to address a little bit more the, um, uh, the Berthold example in terms of the neurology. But I really took it that there is actually, uh, we go down to the still, that we actually see different kinds of perceptions. We see still, we see motion. Because we have the cinema that comes all the still go into motion, we need to the two. Are they different, part, different kinds of brain activity, or are they one? So it seems to me looking at photos and looking at things in motion are actually different. Yeah, I'm, I can't, I'm not claiming to be a neurologist here. You know, I, as I say, you know, I rely on some neurologists to give me information, but I can't, uh, you know. It's an important I, thing to find out, think about, because if the still image is just triggering something else in the brain and the motion image is about something else happening in the brain, we go about motion in the brain without the problem of still. Yeah. And still is sort of the shock of the other thing. Yeah. Something isn't connected except by shock, which is uh, kind of an interesting alternate mm-hmm. reading. Yeah. No, I think this is quite possible, and you know, I hope that there are people who are working on that. Um, but it's not. It's not my area. Now, I'm not. I, in no sense by saying that am I trivializing it. I think it's extremely important. But um, but it's curious when I've talked to people whose area. It is. I haven't asked exactly this question, but it's, they aren't asking the questions I would ask, if you know what I mean. Now, maybe that means it needs collaboration, um, but, uh, but at the same time, it's also like, it is slightly a different area, but I agree that it's extremely interesting. You know, and my, my intuition is that they are different, you know, just based on my own phenomenological experience, but I also know that, that we can't translate that you know, into... into into that type of experimental data. So. Thank you for a really exciting talk. Um, I have a question that might sound dense or obvious, but. Um, Those are the best time. Excellent. Um, I noticed that we keep talking about um, actual, actual movement 
versus perceived movement. Mm -hmm. But in all of these devices, there is actual movement, whether mm -hmm. it's the disc or right, the drum right. or the yeah. stroke of film yes. through a, a projector. And what the, there is some tool that um, somehow isolates our static viewpoint so that we're, we're not yes. looking at the apparatus that's moving, we're only looking at that one right. part. Right, so the like aperture. It, yeah. Exactly. Um, and so do you think that that masking is part of the, it seems to simultaneously uh, hide the, the physically moving mm -hmm. larger, bulkier object? Mm -hmm. um, does that help produce the wonder, or do you think that that is more um, producing confusion? Mm -hmm. Well, um, first off, speaking technically, of course, it's extremely uh, important and even determinative that you have the apparatus that has a shutter and an aperture so that you're not getting a blur of motion, you know, which if you just spun a zoetrope, not looking at it through the drum, you would just see a blur, you know. But, be, but what the combination of the, uh, you know, of the motion and the aperture do is break it into still discrete moments, you know, uh, which, you know, are what allow you to make this transformation into motion. So speaking mechanically and physically, they're, they're absolutely essential. It also, though, interests me, again, how do we get at that phenomenologically? You know, does it just dissolve in our uh, viewing of motion, or, or is it part of the, the actual experience? I tend to think it is part of the actual experience. I mean, it's interesting. I worked with, um, discussed this a lot with Ken Jacobs, experimental filmmaker who works with uh, various types of 3D illusions and motion picture illusions. And one of the things he always works with is various types of shutters, even ones that he will put in front of a, of a, um, of a projector. And he says, you know, he speaks of this, you know, very unscientifically because doesn't work without the flicker. You know? And that there is something about that that I think is absolutely true, not just mechanically. That there's something about the actual experience of flicker, of the alternation of darkness, uh, that, is, uh, that is essential for this on, on more than a mechanical level. And it's, it's really kind of difficult to figure out exactly uh, what all that involves, but uh, I agree it's very rich, and it relates to the shutter and the camera. I mean, part of my work will be interrelating, you know, this achieving of a mo moving image with at the same time in the 19th century the achieving of instantaneous photography, which is to say something that stills motion. You know, that at the same time that you have the achieving of motion, you also have the stilling of motion. And the two, even though they're obviously opposite, are to me dialectically related. And of course, obviously, motion picture photography depends on the two of them coming together. You have the, the possibility of a camera actually stilling a motion and then a projector blending it like, like a zoetrope. Uh, and the, therefore, this whole idea of the shutter and what the shutter, I think, does primarily is to create an experience of a discreteness of time that's beyond human perception, in a certain sense. There's this very interesting thing that I found, or that actually my colleague Joel Snyder and one of his students found, of uh, Galton, you know, who um, is this, you know, Darwin's cousin. He's one of the people who invents uh, the system of fingerprinting, and he also is involved with ideas about photography and composite photography. And he also invents, he's very interested in Marais and Muybridge, and he invents a thing where he says you can look through it. It's not a camera, it's a viewer. It's a shutter viewer. And it'll show you an instant so that actually what you're seeing won't have any motion. You actually see, you know, the horse as though it was frozen in a MyBridge photograph. Now, I think he was probably crazy. There are a lot of things that indicate Galton was out of his mind. But nonetheless, that ambition, I want to be able to get to the point kind of, of seeing 
an instant where motion doesn't play any role uh, is, is important, I think. And it has to do with this sense of dividing up time into tiny increments. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, the, the, they do have a viewer. I mean, you, you, you have to know how to look at it. The slots are in the center of the disc. And so, you know, you don't look at the disc. You hold it up. You look through the disc, through the slots, which are revolving, and you're seeing through the slot, the image in the mirror. And the image in the mirror looks like it's running. If you get in front of it, you don't see anything. I mean, or you see a blur. You don't see uh, motion. You have to look at it from the back through the slots. So there is a viewer, even though it's, it's not separate from the disc. It's, it's contained in the disc, it's, but it's in the center, or sometimes in some forms it's, in the, uh, it's, it's around the periphery. Uh, but yeah, but you have to, you have, to have the flicker. You have to have the shutter. Can I ask a question from this side, Scott? Yeah. Um, my question is about, so if it's actually the still image that is an illusion, or and I don't want to use that word because mm. you really see it, it's mm-hmm. kind of a, um, an imposition or a fiction, mm-hmm. or a fetish of some kind, then in a way, does that make all animation a reanimation? Yeah. Qu- quick answer would be yes, but let me kind of explain why I think it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Of course, still images exist. That's what an image is. The point is that they aren't good models for how we see. They're totally defamiliarized and distorted models. Now, as defamiliarization, as works of art, therefore, they're really powerful. And that's why painting is extraordinary, you know. Uh, or still photography. You know, it's not just like they're, they're nonsense because that's not how we see the world because how we see the world in art is not how we see the world. It's how, how the world gets rearranged uh, through, through a medium, through a, through a work. But exactly one of the things that's fascinating, I think, about, particularly if we think of a flip book, is we see a still image and then it starts to move and we go, oh, isn't that amazing, a still image moving, but then also, oh, isn't it weird that it's still, you know, I mean, in, in other words, it goes in a cycle. Uh, as I said, it's simultaneously a surprise to us because most images, I mean, it's maybe changing a bit in a saturation of moving images, which we live in now. But still, most images are still. And certainly, traditionally, most images are still. So a moving image is a novelty in that point of view. But then it's also, in a way, the uncanny, you know, it's, it's the familiar that's been repressed in a certain way because, in fact, yeah, the world moves. So, so we simultaneously get surprised and then also like, yeah, that's a face smiling at me like faces do, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you.